Cronkite News starts now. Welcome to this Thursday edition of Cronkite News. I'm Jamie Landers. And I'm Tina Giuliano. Thank you for joining us as we work remotely to bring you the latest information on the coronavirus pandemic and how it's affecting Arizonans. Last night, the U.S. Senate passed the largest fiscal stimulus package in American history, totaling almost three times the size of the fiscal stimulus passed in 2008. Cronkite News reporter Dylan McKim spoke with a local expert to see what's exactly inside the bill. Totaling over $2 trillion, the new stimulus package will be putting money back into Americans' pockets. Passing in a unanimous vote in the Senate, the bill offers relief to individuals, businesses, and health care. Jonathan Frutkin of Radix Law helps us break it down. One aspect of this, is, which will affect everybody directly, is direct cash payments. Now, not everybody's getting them, but most people are. Individuals earning less than $75,000 per year can expect a one-time payment of $1,200. Couples making less than $150,000 will receive a $2,400 check. So to get your check, they're going to look at your 2018 tax return. The bill also increases unemployment insurance by promising an extra $600 on top of normal state benefits each month for the next four months. For a lot of people, that is the difference between, you know, putting food on the table and paying some bills and not. And so for people who are unemployed, that can add up to about $2,400 extra that you'll get in your unemployment benefits. Small businesses and larger corporations will be getting some help in this bill as well. There are $367 billion for small business loans that helps owners meet their payroll. A $500 billion fund set up with the Federal Reserve will offer loans to corporations in desperate need, such as airline companies and hotels. Here's our kind of short-term rule of thumb. If you're an employee and you're looking for your benefits, first go to your employer. If you are a small business employer and you're looking for help from the federal government, first go to your bank. Hospitals and health systems will also be receiving $130 billion to help them fight the spread of coronavirus. So there's still developments that we're going to see over the next week or two. Nothing to panic about because the money is going to come. The bill now moves to the House to be voted on. A vote is expected Friday. Then it would still need the president's signature. Arizona health officials have now reported eight deaths and 508 cases of COVID-19. As the numbers continue to grow, they warn this is just the beginning of the coronavirus crisis in our state. The number of cases is expected to double every six days. During a news conference, the Arizona Department of Health Services director said they're preparing rapidly to increase the number of equipment and supplies to brace for peak hospitalizations in mid-May. We anticipate that we could need an additional 13,000 hospital beds and an additional 1,500 ICU beds. That's um, on top of the current 16,000 beds and 1,500 ICU beds. We believe that the peak of our, our illnesses will start mid to um, end of April with peak hospitalizations in May. This is the first time the Department of Health Services has given an estimate on when Arizona will reach its COVID-19 peak. Many states, including New Mexico and California, have issued stay-at-home orders. That means people can't leave their homes unless it's absolutely necessary. But as Cronkite News reporter Isabella Holsizer explains, that's not the case in Arizona. And that has some city leaders upset. Staff Mayor Coral Evans had her way, all city residents would be sheltering in place to help combat the spread of COVID-19. And if we all were to stop and go home and practice social distancing and just stop for 15 days, as a country, we could weather this. Um, and we could recover even more quickly and it wouldn't be drawn out. But what she and other Arizona mayors want is the opposite of what Governor Doug Ducey is suggesting. On Monday, Ducey said he hasn't yet intended to put a statewide stay-at-home order in place. Arizona is not there yet. We're not at the same stage as other states. On March 20th, Ducey issued one order requiring restaurants, movie theaters, and other businesses to close to help prevent the spread of coronavirus. 
And he released a list of essential businesses that could stay open should he decide people need to stay at home. Some Arizona mayors say that list is far too extensive. It includes businesses like grocery stores and pharmacies, but also recreational businesses like golf courses. He has defined essential services incredibly broadly. On Tuesday, a group of mayors from Tucson, Flagstaff, Tolson, Somerton, and Winslow sent a letter to the governor criticizing his list. Every city and every county in the state moves at a different pace because of uh, of what's happening in their town or in their city. That's why Romero says decisions about whether people should stay at home should come from city officials and not the governor. Uh, right now he has everything flowing through the state government, so he is the decision maker on a huge number of decisions that are normally reserved for cities and their elected officials. 18 states across the U.S. have told residents to stay home, according to research done by the New York Times. In Phoenix, Isabella Holsizer, Cronkite News. The governor signed another executive order Tuesday that postpones evictions for the next 120 days. So we want to hear from you now. Should golf courses be allowed to remain open or be forced to close in Arizona? Gia says absolutely not. In this health crisis, we don't need any more people infected. Governor Doug Ducey needs to do better. While Iman wouldn't call golf courses essential, she doesn't see the harm in keeping them open. She says it's not a sport that requires being close together. Teresa adds, if playgrounds are off limits, the greens should be too. But Patricia points out that golf courses are good for the well-being. And finally, Sean says while it's well and good for the golfers, what about all the support staff, clubhouse staff, greenskeepers, and more? Are golf carts six feet wide? Golf is hardly essential. It's not too late to join the conversation. Just go to our Cronkite News social media feeds to vote in our interactive polls. Right now, it's important for everyone to stay as informed as possible in order to help stop the spread of the coronavirus. But when someone doesn't speak English, that can be a challenge and it's dangerous. So as Alexa Fumayor reports, some are taking translations into their own hands to help keep the non-English speakers up to date. Isolating ourselves and making someone that doesn't speak English into a, a lesser class isn't going to help, particularly in a health crisis when you need everyone to be following the same particular procedures. ACC echoes the concerns many community advocates and local leaders have about what they see is a lack of multilingual information regarding precautions and safety measures surrounding the coronavirus. Just a week ago, the Centers for Disease Control and the federal government had little to no information about COVID-19 available in other languages besides English. In most instances, that's why I think it's important that local offices do make that effort um, to fill in that gap that we see. The city of Phoenix has been posting updates in Spanish on its social media channels and Tucson Mayor Regina Romero has made it a point to do daily video updates both English and Spanish. En respuesta a los cambios diarios, we're trying to be as inclusive as we possibly can. A lead Arizona Governor Doug Ducey seems to have taken notice of. He recently tweeted the Arizona Department of Health has created a hotline for coronavirus questions in English and Spanish. The governor's office actually uh, gave us a little thumbs up and some kudos for for doing the Spanish language videos and uh, they started doing translations for all their press releases as well so I think that um, they realized that it is of value to to do everything in Spanish. In Arizona, with a little more than 27% of households speaking a language other than English, some community leaders say the state still has been too slow to provide information. I think what's hard is when we get resources that are not translated. Um, as things are moving so quickly, it's very hard to keep up and have the capacity to do that. And so we're relying more and more on Organizations. organizations like Puente Arizona, a human rights advocate group, have been trying to fill that void for Spanish speakers. I hope that our government and states understand that you're not going to be able to um, just shoo us away. 
we need these resources. Resources they say they've had to create on their own. These include Spanish graphics with information showing what coronavirus is, the symptoms, how it's transmitted, and when it's time to go to the doctor. These basic terms that we're trying to come to grips with on English speaking language, as well, we're translating that to Spanish so that our people can understand this information. With COVID-19 cases continuing to grow in Arizona, many say getting crucial information into the hands of as many people as possible is now a matter of saving as many lives as possible. There's just such a massive need for us to be unified. In Phoenix, Alexa Famayor, Cronkite News. After receiving criticism, the Arizona Department of Health has now added a Spanish coronavirus page on their website. The Trump administration has also released additional materials in Spanish. Necessary medical supplies are becoming more scarce during the COVID-19 crisis, including face masks. That's why one group in Flagstaff is dedicating their time and skills to sew masks and donate them to healthcare workers and nonprofits like shelters. The Arizona Daily Sun shared their story on Twitter saying what the region lacks in supplies to stop the spread of the coronavirus can be gained in skill. And this trend is not just happening in Arizona, but in other states across the U.S. as well. The Seattle Times tweeting, hospital workers in Washington state have been making protective gear out of office supplies and other run-of-the-mill materials as they deal with a severe shortage of equipment needed to care for patients who may have COVID-19. And the New York Times tweeted this, saying, while the DIY masks are not as effective as high-grade masks, doctors say they're freeing up the surgical masks needed for those with the highest risk. During this time of self-isolation, many of us are stuck indoors, working remotely. But as Cronkite News reporter Marcella Bayano shows us, one local school providing education for the visually impaired is not letting the outbreak slow down their progress. Savvy Services for the Blind have now moved all of their programs and classes all online for their visually impaired students, all while they handle unique challenges during the outbreak. This school providing services for the visually impaired is usually filled with eager students and teachers. I use these to teach. But now it's moved completely online due to the coronavirus and recommendations to practice social distancing. We do know that um, there's a lot of additional challenges that happen for blind people um, because of the social isolation um, issue. And the main thing that we could do is share resources. Resources such as virtual classes and social events are being provided to their nearly 70 visually impaired students led by instructors like Jessica Rojas. How are we going to keep people from feeling like they're alone and isolated and not being able to practice their skills because they work so hard throughout the year? Braille courses used to be taught in person with household items such as muffin pans and tennis balls, but now everything is taught either through video chat. Do you have any questions? Over the phone or through Facebook Live like their cane courses. We're able to still try to find a way to stay connected with our students. Student Tim Kalk, who lost his sight in 2018, says the remote classes now provide a more personal teaching environment. It's a lot better, I think, because you get a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with the instructor. A unique challenge that they're facing is trying to access important information about the coronavirus. A lot of this information is presented in maps, charts, and graphs. And because of this, their assisted technology and other applications can't read this. However, a newly introduced COVID-19 hotline is helping with the problem. Doug Ducey did a really good thing the other day on um, creating that 211 hotline. I was actually in contact with the Maricopa County uh, uh, Department of Emergency Management, just begging them to have an accessible automated outline. Even during this uncertain time, Savvy is instilling the message of hope, regardless of their circumstances. We really wanted to show the world and show our students that even during the coronavirus, even through this whole crisis, that like you could still expect more of yourself. Savvy Services is also helping their students connect more socially by hosting virtual lunch and virtual happy hour meetings. In Phoenix, Marcel Beato, Cronkite News. Meanwhile, the Arizona Department of Transportation is continuing to ensure Arizona's nearly 7,000 miles of highways are maintained. They say rest stops and parking facilities will still be available for truck drivers transporting critical goods across the state. Stranded motorists can still expect help from crew patrols along the highway. 
and crashes will still be cleared as quickly as possible. As for ADOT's Motor Vehicle Division, there are limited in-person office hours, but they say most transactions can be done online at servicearizona.com. Many businesses in Arizona have found ways to adapt to their practices in order to help curb the spread of COVID-19. But what about medical marijuana dispensaries? Cronkite News reporter Madison Atkinson found out why they're keeping their doors open. The state of Arizona is allowing medical marijuana dispensaries to remain open during the COVID-19 pandemic. We are legally required to, so it is a, a, in rule by the Department of Health Services that um, uh, any licensed dispensary in Arizona has to be uh, in operation for at least 30 hours a week. Samuel Richards, executive director of the Arizona Dispensaries Association, says dispensary owners have been monitoring the situation very closely. Many dispensaries have moved to uh, uh, online orders or, or pre-orders um, so that uh, they can uh, more quickly uh, serve patients um, and uh, with constant and consistent communication via emails and texts. According to the Arizona Department of Health Services, there are approximately a quarter million patients across the state with underlying conditions. Many of those conditions are the ones that that uh, the CDC and the World Health Organization give special consideration to to be uh, uh, extremely careful for uh, dur during uh, th this time. Most dispensaries have social distancing lines outside and are only allowing two or three patients inside the store at a time. Richard says patients are preparing for extended self-quarantine. You even saw the governor highlight that um, uh, one of the things really that you should stock up on was uh, 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 prescriptions, right? So I think that some folks uh, uh, translated that advice to uh, the, their, their uh, medical cannabis. Madison Atkinson, Cronkite News. Across Arizona, people are using their extra time and resources to give back to communities during the COVID-19 outbreak. These acts of humanity are providing some happiness and hope for many, as Melanie Porter reports. One small business owner in Chandler is offering his services to keep kids active and out of the house while still staying safe. The company, The Window Ninjas, is helping to keep playgrounds germ-free. The first thing we do is we have so 10% sodium hypochlorite, which is bleach, um, so we, we spray it over everything, let it dwell for about five minutes just so it can soak up any virus and germs and stuff like that. Um, and then we, we just rinse it really well for about 10 or 15 minutes with the pressure washer. His efforts are helping other small business owners like Debbie Chavez, owner of We Blessings Preschool. It looks amazing. It smells amazing. <laughs> and I just feel really good about the fact that they did this for free. They didn't offer, you know, ask for anything. They wouldn't even take a tip or anything like that, but they were just doing it as a community outreach. Johnson hopes that by helping kids and families stay active in a safe way, he'll be able to reduce the spread of COVID-19, all while building some name recognition around the Valley. Our hope, of course, first is to help the community, but also to get to let people know who we are. Everybody's anxious, everybody's nervous, and um, helping one another for the good of the cause is uh, what we all should be doing. So I just thank them so much from the bottom of my heart and from all of our little preschoolers. Melanie Porter, Cronkite News. We want to hear from you about other acts of humanity during this crisis. If you or someone you know is stepping up to help others, please email us at cronkitenews at asu.edu and add the word humanity to the subject line. You may have noticed it's a little chilly outside today. That's because a storm system is moving in, bringing a drop in temps across Arizona. CJ Chires is standing by with more on the cool down. What can we all expect, CJ? Yes, you both are definitely correct about those lower temperatures that we're experiencing, especially here in the valley. I'll go ahead and start by showing you the temps expected for later this evening. Um, currently, right now, we're experiencing we're in the high 60s, and that will pretty much carry on through 5 and 6 p.m. And by 9 o'clock, we're going to be down into the low 60s, but as you can see, we're going to have those sunny and cleary skies all throughout the rest of the evening today. As for tomorrow here in Phoenix, by 8 a.m. tomorrow, we're expected to be at 53, 53 degrees with only a 5% chance of rain and that 
uh, percentage of precipitation will drop down as we move on throughout the day. By midday, we're going to be in the low 60s, and we're going to that's pretty much going to be the story for the rest of the day tomorrow as well. And by 8 o'clock tomorrow night, we're going to be experiencing that 60 degree weather for tomorrow. As for the rest of the state, as you can see in locations in the desert, um, it's pretty much kind of what we expect. Nothing but sunny skies, except for in Kingman, they're expecting to see partly cloudy weather. And the percentage of precipitation is going to be from 10% all the way to zero for the rest of the for the rest of those desert areas. But as we move on to the high country in Northern Arizona, it's a completely different story. As you can see, they're experiencing well below freezing temperatures in Grand Canyon and Flagstaff, and they're expecting even some chances of snow. There's a 40% chance of snow in the Grand Canyon and 50% chance in Flagstaff. So it's a tale of two seasons as we move from the desert to the high country in Northern Arizona. But that is kind of what you expect around this time of year. And as for the eight day forecast, I'll end off with that. Like I said, we are experiencing that bit of a cold front right now, so we're actually in the high to mid six degree weather for today and tomorrow, but those temps will gradually climb up as we move on throughout the rest of the eight days. And by this weekend, we're gonna be in the low to, excuse me, we're gonna be in the, no, the low to mid seventies, and we're gonna be flirting with the eighties by the time we get to next Monday. But by Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, we're gonna be well into the eighties, and we'll be even flirting with 90 degree weather by come Wednesday next week. So that cold front, while we're experiencing chilly temperatures as of right now, that will, it seems that it'll be completely different by next week. And with summer being right around the corner, that hot desert sun is definitely gonna start warming up temperatures here in Phoenix and across the state. So you guys enjoy those mild temperatures while you still can because summer is right around the corner. When Joe Madden was the manager of the Tampa Bay Rays in 2012, he started an event to shave heads in support of pediatric cancer awareness. Now as manager of the Angels, he's brought the event to Arizona. Cronkite News reporter Brandon Jensen was at Tempe Diablo Stadium for the ninth annual event. Angels players, coaches, and fans showed up one morning to Tempe Diablo Stadium with full heads of hair. But by game time, many of them had totally new dues to help raise money for pediatric cancer awareness. I think it's pretty cool. Um, a lot of the guys signed up to cut their hair. Um, so I think it's a cool thing to, not just for our team, but for cancer and for, um, for a good cause. Joe Madden's Respect 90 Foundation began hosting Balding All Angels under a different name eight years ago at the Tampa Bay Rays. He carried on the tradition while he's the Cubs manager and now with the Angels. We're all worried about our hair. We're all worried about like the looks going to be different. We worry about the wrong things a lot of times. Um, it'll grow back. For some people, maybe not, but it should grow back. Uh, but when guys uh, take this moment and, and do this because they want to, they know it's important that they that they they combine and they show solidarity with people that are impacted or afflicted. I love it, and so it speaks loudly for our guys. Since 2012, 350 thousand dollars have been raised to benefit those affected by pediatric cancer. Much of the money goes toward turning gloomy hospital rooms into a more pleasant environment. How much we raise is one thing, but the participation that matters the most. Um, always it's about raising awareness, uh, really creating um, more empathy uh, among our civilization so that we help others in need. This just happens to be cancer. Whether he was with the Cubs, Rays, or Angels, Joe Madden has always found players who feel the same way he does and want to participate in the event alongside their manager. I just hope that, you know, all the kids out there just see that, you know, there's, there's you know, professional athletes, there's a lot of different people, there's coaches, there's um, a lot of people out here thinking about them. Parker Markle has seen this event grow over the years. He participated as a member of the Rays organization. Now he's doing the same as a member of the Angels pitching staff. This world that we live in, and you know, the baseball world is, uh, you know, we're very grateful and you know honored to be doing this, and for there to be, you know, kids out there that are, you know, young, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten years old, um, going through a life-changing event like this, you know, knowing that people do care out there. While Madden's uniform has changed over the years, his haircut each year is sure to stay, and he hopes that the positive turnout this year will lead to even more participation in the years to come. In Tempe, Brandon Jensen, Cronkite News. Proceeds from the event will benefit the Jonathan Jack Children's Cancer Institute at Miller's Children's and Women's Hospital in Long Beach, California. That's it for Cronkite News. From our homes to yours, thank you for watching.
For Arizona news updates throughout the day, follow us on Facebook and Twitter. And find us online at cronkitenews.azpbs.org.